Hey guys, welcome to a new series here on the Guitar Story in general that I call Forgotten Fretmasters. A series where we will examine guitarists or musicians who often toiled behind the scenes, sometimes as a member of a backing band or a session musician, or just someone who's often forgotten when we make our top 10 lists of the greatest this or the best that. Today, for our first episode, we're going to be looking at a guitarist whose musical chops had a huge impact on the artists that he supported. For our first episode, we're going to look at guitarist and arranger Mick Ronson. Welcome, welcome once again to the first episode of Forgotten Fretmasters, the series where we will examine lesser known but no less important musicians from rock history. But, as always, please consider subscribing to the Guitar Historian channel for more rock history content like this, and be sure to drop a like on the video to let YouTube know that you think that other guitar fans would like to see content like this. Today we're going to look at a guitarist and an arranger who had some surprising impacts on the artists that he supported over the years. And even though he didn't always have to burn up the fretboard with guitar gymnastics, he created some of the most memorable and iconic riffs of 70s rock. Of course, I'm talking about the magnificent Mick Ronson, best known as the lead guitarist during David Bowie's most, in my opinion, awesome period as a member of his unofficially named Spiders from Mars backing band between 1970 and 1973. But there are some other little gems and surprises about Ronson's career that might actually surprise you. So stay tuned to find out about Ronson's timeless contribution to one of the biggest hits of the early 1980s. I have a feeling some of you may be surprised about it. Michael Ronson was born on 26 May 1946 in the English port town of Kingston upon Hull, usually just abbreviated to Hull. A hardened sea town on the Upper East Coast right off the North Sea, so it wasn't every day that kids were classically trained in music at a young age, but that was exactly what happened with young Michael, who learned piano, recorder, and violin. He had hoped to become a professional cellist, but like so many youngsters in the late 50s, once he heard the electric guitar, he became hooked on the new sound. In Ronson's case, it was Dwayne Eddy of Rebel Rouser and the Peter Gunn theme fame, because he thought Eddy's bass notes mimic the sound of a cello. At least, that's probably what he told his parents to con them into getting a guitar. Anyway, by the time he was 17, Ronson had already joined his first band called The Mariners, which was a fitting name for a band from Hull, whose first show was 35 miles away in Bruff at the Bruff Village Hall, a show that supported the Keith Heard band and which the Mariners were paid a whopping 10 shillings for their appearance. Eventually, Ronson would move on to another local band called The Crestes, who would gain some traction around Hull, eventually playing regular gigs at several local halls and venues. But 1965 would see the next chapter in Ronson's life when he would move down to London to seek work. He would take several odd jobs around town as a mechanic and also playing in several bands, including one called The Voice. That job, however, ended ignominiously one day as Ronson and his drummer showed up to the band's flat to find their gear piled outside with the note explaining that the rest of the band had moved the Bahamas. Must be nice. Ronson would knock around some more in London before deciding to move back to his hometown of Hull later in 1966. He would join up with the top band in Hull at the time called The Rats. One member of the revolving lineup would be drummer John Cambridge. Although Cambridge would leave the Rats in 1968, he would eventually return to Hall in 1970, specifically to recruit Ronson to a new recording band that he was putting together. Calling the band The Hype, Cambridge had joined a burgeoning young singer-songwriter named David Bowie, who needed a backing band to play tour dates in support of his new self-titled album, which included the surprise 1969 hit Space Oddity. Cambridge found Ronson performing his day job with the whole Parks Department as a gardener. At the moment, he was marking out a rugby pitch. At first, Ronson was reluctant to give up his day job for another trip to London, but eventually Ronson relented and joined the hype, making his live debut with Bowie just two days later on John Peel's BBC Radio 1 show. 
The first Bowie album that Ronson would see action on was The Man Who Sold the World, and it would become clear that Bowie and Ronson's musical chemistry was going to be an important alchemy that guided the coming sound of the early 1970s hard rock movement. Ronson's input on songs like Width of a Circle, which would be seen as an early progenitor of prog rock, and the title track of the album, which is based around Ronson's circular guitar riff, pushed Bowie's songwriting and arrangements into new heights. Despite this, after the album, Ronson, along with producer and keyboardist Tony Visconti and drummer Mick Woodmancy, would temporarily leave Bowie due to inactivity, creative differences, and Bowie's ongoing troubles with his old record label. Bowie would go through some ch 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 changes over the next year or so, eventually reaching out to Ronson, who was enthusiastic about rejoining Bowie for his next escapades. They would briefly start a band called Arnold Corns, which would record several early versions of songs that would eventually end up on Bowie's next two albums. Those albums would set the tone for Bowie's rock superstardom and launch a new genre of rock and roll, ushering in the ultra-debauchery and androgyny that would come to define the 1970s. Eventually settling on a simple three-piece band of Ronson on lead guitar, piano, and arrangements, Trevor Boulder on bass, and Mick Woody Woodmancy on drums, Keyboardist Rick Wakeman, another member of Bowie's backing band, would record 1971's Hunky Dory with the band, but then would turn down Bowie's offer to remain for his next album to join the progressive rock band Yes. The remaining three-piece would become known as the Spiders from Mars, taking their name from the 1972 album that would go on to become one of the greatest rock albums of all time. The rise and fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, usually just shortened to Ziggy Stardust, was a powerhouse of early 70s rock, and the band's over-sexualized and over-the-top live shows would go on to be called glam rock. Musically, Mick Ronson's fingerprints were all over the album, not the least of which was his 1968 Gibson Les Paul Custom, which had been stripped down to the bare wood, a modification that Mick felt increased the instrument's resonance. This was no doubt a callback to Ronson's classical training on the violin and cello. He also pulled off the humbucker covers, allowing the guitar to achieve a wild, aggressive tone. Ronson pushed the Les Paul through a 100-watt Marshall, and he was not shy about cranking the amp to the top of the limits of its KT-88 tubes. But the secret weapon to Ronson's tone was his use of what many players call a cocked or parked wah pedal which is opening the wah until it gets to the sweet spot of tonality that you're looking for and then just leaving it parked there. But it wasn't just guitar that Ronson was known for on the album. He would play the bluesy piano lines on the album's opening track, Five Years. He played the Mellotron on Starman. He provided all the backing vocals on the album. And he would also arrange any and all string or classical instruments on the album. The album and subsequent tour would make Bowie an absolute superstar and bring his band into the forefront of rock music of the early 1970s. That tour would span over 18 months and eventually partially support Bowie's next album, Aladdin Sane, finally ending in June of 1973. Although Aladdin Sane featured more backing musicians such as a gaggle of backup singers and several brass musicians, the core of Bowie's backing band remained intact throughout the recording of that album as well. Once again, Ronson's guitar pounded the sound of the Gene Genie and Panic in Detroit, and his musical arrangements pop up throughout the album. Aladdin Sane was already an early change in Bowie's many personas, as he did not want to become defined forever by the Ziggy Stardust character. That being said, the character did mirror Ziggy very much, and Bowie would eventually call the Aladdin Sane character Ziggy Goes to America. Later in 1973, Bowie would bang out an album of covers called Pinups that featured an eclectic mix of songs that had inspired Bowie in the past and the present. They included Pink Floyd's See Emily Play, Friday on My Mind by the Easy Beats, and even two early Who numbers I can't explain in any way, anyhow, anywhere. Although neither musician had intended it, it would be the last time that Ronson and Bowie would collaborate on a whole album. Bowie would go on to record his next album, Diamond Dogs, without Ronson, as Mick had decided to record his debut solo album, Slaughter on 10th Avenue, which would be well received by critics and peak at number 9 on the UK album charts. Another factoid about the album was that it featured Ainsley Dunbar on drums of John Mayall, Frank Zappa, Journey, and about a thousand other bands' fame. Ronson's album would continue the tradition of Bowie's glam rock, but it didn't do enough on its own to catapult Ronson to star status. 
Bronson would then drift around through the mid-70s, making many contributions to other artists' work. Ian Hunter, formerly of Mott the Hoople, would record his debut self-titled album in 1975, and Ronson played guitar on the top 20 hit, Once Bitten, Twice Shy. Sound familiar? It would go on to be covered nearly 15 years later by hair metal band Great White. Hunter and Ronson would record together for many years, even culminating in a Hunter-Ronson band that toured for a while. Ronson would contribute lead guitar on a mix of acts over the next few years, like David Cassidy from The Partridge Family and Roger Daltrey for his solo released in 1979, One of the Boys. But arguably Ronson's most iconic and memorable contribution would come in 1982, when he joined John Cougar Mellencamp to work on his American Fool album. Mellencamp was particularly stuck on a song called Jack and Diane, and had even resigned it to the scrap heap as he couldn't seem to get on the same page with his band to make it work musically. Mellencamp would tell this story to Classic Rock Magazine in 2008. I owe Mick Ronson the hit song Jack and Diane. Mick was very instrumental in helping me arrange that song as I'd thrown it on the junk heap. Ronson came down and played on three or four tracks and worked on the American Fool record for four or five weeks. All of a sudden, for Jack and Diane, Mick said, Johnny, you should put baby rattles on there. I thought, what the F does put baby rattles on the record mean? So he put the percussion on there, and then he sang the part, let it rock, let it roll, as a choirish type thing, which had never occurred to me. And that is the part everybody remembers on the song. It was Ronson's idea. In addition to that arrangement, Ronson played the jarring signature electric riff behind Mellencamp's acoustic guitar parts. A song which Mellencamp had almost abandoned would become a number one hit that would stay on the top of the charts for four weeks. <laughs> Mick Ronson would go on to join many other exploits, including again with Ian Hunter a few times. He would make an appearance on David Bowie's 1993 album Black Tie, White Noise, playing on the Cream cover I Feel Free, which incidentally they had covered way back in the Ziggy days. He would tour with Bob Dylan as a member of the Rolling Thunder Review. He would spend a lot of the late 80s and early 90s actually producing a number of obscure bands. And Ronson would also release two further solo albums, sadly the second of which, Heaven and Hull, would be released posthumously. Ronson would be diagnosed with liver cancer in 1992, and he passed away in April of 93 at only 46 years old. And nowhere was Ronson more missed than in his hometown of Hull, where a memorial stage would be erected in his honor at the Queen's Garden. Later, a guitar sculpture would be unveiled in East Park, the same park where Ronson worked as a gardener way, way back before finding rock immortality all those years ago. Finally, a memorial show entitled Turn and Face the Strange was created, featuring a multimedia experience of clips and interviews from friends and family and a live band which would perform songs from Ronson's past. The band, of course, consisted of several of Ronson's old stablemates from the Rats, as well as John Cambridge, who had originally recruited Ronson to play with David Bowie way back in 1970. Among guitar players, Mick Ronson's legacy is ironclad. He took distortion and deceptively simple chord-based riffs to a new level with his work as Bowie's lead guitarist. Most hardcore guitar fans will think I'm crazy for calling him forgotten in the first place, but it's also Ronson's work as an arranger that should clearly get more notice. The sound that reaches your ears on Bowie's early work, a lot of that is due to Ronson's ear for music and his ability to intuitively know how to build a song from a rough demo to a massive hit. He is definitely underrated for that contribution, and also for having his Les Paul licked more times than David Bowie than any other guitar in history. That's our first episode of Forgotten Fretmasters, guys. Let me know what you think of the new series, and in a little twist, comment below on who you'd like to see me examine next, and I just might take you up on your suggestion. As always, thanks for watching the Guitar Story and channel. Remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more content like this, and we will see you next time.